I'm going to kick it off then. Um, I am uh, David Konitsky. I don't think many of you, if any of you, uh, have heard from me or know about me. I joined uh, Down in Strategies in Kwai maybe three, four months back. Uh, I'm the COO, Chief Operating Officer here. Um, but I've been in crypto for some time. I got my start in 2012 coming from uh, FinTech where I was at a company called Second Market, um, the predecessor company to Digital Currency Group, where I built and ran Grayscale Investments for the first few years uh, of his existence uh, before spending some time at Fidelity and Circle. And then most recently, for the past few years, I was at Kraken, where I, I built and ran Kraken Bank there. So joined uh, uh, Dominant Strategies and the Quai team at the end of last year. Um, and uh, I'm super excited to talk to you today about kind of a different take on uh, proof of work mining. Um, I think a lot, a lot of people kind of like understand the basics, but um, a lot of it is a, an underappreciated and underexplored design space that Qua is taking advantage of in a totally different and novel way that I think is uh, pretty interesting. So let's kick it off. Um, we're going to be talking today with just to start with kind of a foundation layer of um, how proof of work mining in general works using Bitcoin as our reference example. Uh, we'll go over kind of we'll start from the very bottom the basic stuff that if you've heard about mining you know about um, but then we'll build our way up to some kind of more niche um, and innovative stuff um, culminating with what Kwai is uh, is doing in a very different way um, so let me run through it so first of all what's the role of miners in a proof-of-work network and even here people kind of get confused you hear a lot of people talking about Miners validate transactions, um, but they don't. Like nodes validate transactions. Miners can be nodes, but uh, miners process and confirm transactions and add them to the chain. Um, and they also serve a couple other functions. Obviously, their main one is to secure the network. That is their their primary function uh, to add computational work to the chain so that it's economically prohibitive to redo it or change it. Um, they also serve, though, as a conduit for new supply and distribution entering the market. And in that context, later in these slides, we'll talk about some interesting reframing of the function that mining serves. Nodes, on the other hand, uh, they're the ones that validate transactions. They enforce protocol rules. Indeed, even the Nakamoto consensus of longest, heaviest chain. Um, and they maintain the records. Um, so this is the like very, very fundamental base layer of, of the role of miners in a proof of work network. Um, how does this work? How does the mining process work kind of at a step-by-step -step basic level? Um, it's interesting. They, they aren't doing a ton other than kind of like following a process and adding computational work. Uh, a miner uh, goes out and queries the network to collect um, and aggregate pending unconfirmed transactions from the mempool. And they structure them into a potential new block. Um, and with that block data, they just continuously run computations over it, over the block data that produces a unique random block hash as an output. And obviously that output must be lower than the target value that's set by the difficulty level of the network. That's all they're doing. Um, they're not actually verifying or you know, in, doing any diligence on transactions. They're not doing anything novel. They're just following a mechanical process and then running compute over it. Um, the beauty of this, though, as we'll see in later slides, is that they're not doing anything. It's a totally random um, guessing game. Not even a guessing game. They're not even taking guesses. It's a totally random dice roll over and over again. However, the benefits of that and what it means are massively important. So how does that work? Uh, a common, another common mischaracterization that I hear is that miners are solving complex problems or puzzles. They're not. They're just playing a lottery or a dice game. They are not um, adding any knowledge. There is nothing to solve. They are brute force buying lotto tickets and dice rolls. That's all they're doing. And I use those examples because, and this is important, the randomness of the outputs that they're producing. Um, and as a result of that randomness, you get the probabilistic ability to understand how the economics work for difficulty that we'll get to later. Um, basically, it's just imagine a massive dice that has two to the 256 sides um, and they roll 
and just roll and roll. And the network tells them, hey, you have to get a number that's equal to or less than this number. And all they do is roll the dice over and over and over again. Um, and they do that until they find, or not even find, just arrive at a number that meets the criteria um, for the target output value. The point that I'm making here over and over again is that uh, they are not adding any knowledge, doing anything novel, or solving anything. They are rolling a dice to arrive at like a random output over and over again um, until they or some other miner uh, arrives at or produces a number that is equal to or less than the target value set by the network um, according to its difficulty threshold. Uh, and then a new round begins, a new block uh, begins, and you know players can roll as many dice uh, as they want and as many times as they want, uh, but it costs more to do so. This is the best an analogy that I've heard um, for mining, and it clears up a lot of confusion about the function of miners to um, to actually do something that requires expertise other than the actual functional business of electricity and cloud compute that they operate. The actual mining process itself is simply basically a random number generator over and over again that's costly. And that costly piece is what adds the security to the network. Um, these numbers, and every time I look at this, um, <laughs> I've seen it a million times, but math is amazing. Uh, it's incredible how big of a number 2 to the 256 is, um, both in terms of not being able to crack and guess passcodes and encryption, but also just the probabilistic nature of guessing a number within that field and having the outputs be equally likely to be any output within that field. Um, and that's important because when we see and talk about difficulty, that randomness and probabilistic nature makes it predictable in terms of how many hashes a miner will be required or expected to be required on average to mine a block at a particular difficulty level. So that'll be the next thing that we're going to discuss. And how that works is uh, primarily the difficulty adjustment is the central piece here about how this works. So imagine that dice game we just discussed where there's people at a table. Uh, it starts with one person rolling a dice over and over again. And then more people join the table. And that person buys more dice. And they buy dice that can be rolled faster for more cheaply and conduct computation more efficiently um, over and over again. So if you have that scenario where um, a bunch more outputs and hashes are occurring on the network, you are obviously more likely and more quickly going to produce blocks. Um, and that could be problematic if not accounted for. Um, one, uh, again, part of the mining function is to uh, produce supply and distribute it into the network and you don't want oversupply to ruin the supply curve. There's also attack vectors um, if it's not normalized. Um, and there's also resource constraints around the network uh, where you want blocks to be propagated and confirmed by the uh, nodes um, so that the uh, mining process and Nakamoto consensus can continue. The difficulty adjustment and, and the block interval is the, is the central piece here in how it addresses that. Um, and even this is misunderstood. Um, it is true that what the difficulty adjustment is doing is renormalizing back to a protocol mandated block interval of time. Uh, but it's, it's, it's doing more, much more than that, as we'll see. So in Bitcoin, as a reference point, all that happens uh, is, so every 14 days, the network uh, takes a look, the protocol takes a look uh, back over the past 14 days and, and uh, looks at all the, the blocks that have been confirmed and each block has a timestamp associated with it. Uh, and it can estimate then um, how quickly blocks came in over the past 14 days. Uh, Bitcoin sets its block interval um, to be 10 minutes, uh, meaning that every 14 days when it has this difficulty adjustment period, it renormalizes back to 10 minutes. Um, and here on the right, we have just uh, some definitions um, that are useful if you're not familiar with uh, proof of work mining. We've already talked about target where 
the network says, hey, here's a number, uh, miners, you have to produce a hash value that is equal to or less than it. Um, difficulty, as, as we're calling it here, is a measure of how hard it is to mine a block at a given target value, which means how many computations are expected on average uh, to do so. Now, here, when we're talking about network hash rate, we're talking about in aggregate over the network, how many hashes per second can the network or all, all the miners doing on the network. Um, so mechanically here on the left, where you see these periods and times, most people focus on the renormalization back to the block interval. And that's correct. That's, that's one part of what it's doing. And I talked about before, that is part of securing the network and part of processing transactions. Uh, but it's more than that. Um, so Bitcoin works, as I said, where over on the left side here in the purple, let's say in the prior period, uh, we saw a hash rate of 10 hashes per second. Obviously, Bitcoin is massively more than that. But just for ease of, of calculation, let's say that 10 hashes per second. Right. And again, Bitcoin's optimizing for a 10 minute block interval, which is 600 seconds. So it sets at time t, it looks back into period p, p minus one, and says over that period, um, blocks came in at this rate and I could estimate the hash rate was 10 hashes per second. And as a result, I can see how much faster or slower blocks came in over that period than the 10 minute mark. And to the extent that it's faster, or slower, I'm going to adjust the difficulty to renormalize that. And the interesting underlying part there is what the block interval is, is a proxy for the protocol to know how much hash rate is on the network. These protocols are dumb protocols. They don't know anything about the outside world other than what's endogenous to the system. And there are a few things that are endogenous to the system, difficulty and target value. But hash rate, it does not know anything about the hash rate, the network itself, the protocol itself. Um, it knows about a way to calculate the block interval over a prior period. And what it can deduce from that is how much hash rate there was on the network. And we'll discuss how it can do that later. But basically, the, the principle is that if blocks are coming in faster, that means there were more computations per second than there were previously um, because it's a totally probabil probabilistic process. And so what it means is there's more brute force on the network. So in any event, let's say that at time t, it sets difficulty at 6,000 hashes per block. So on average, we expect it to take 6,000 hashes for anyone to mine a block. Then during period p, more hash rate enters the network, um, almost double from 10 hashes per second to 20 hashes per second. And so at time t plus one, what it does is it looks back and it, it averages out all the timestamps across the blocks to see how much faster it came. And what it will see is that they're coming in twice as fast, every five minutes, not 10 minutes. And it can deduce from that, well, I based my last mark of 6,000 hashes per block based on the prior period's 10 hashes per second to normalize back to 10 minutes per block. During this period, I saw them come in five minutes per block. That's a doubling. That means that I can deduce that the hash rate, hashes per second across the network, has doubled. Um, and that's how it then says, well, it's doubled. I need to double the difficulty. And that inverse relationship there, when difficulty goes up, um, the target value also goes up, and it requires more hashes per block. Um, and as a result, as we'll see, it should slow down the time that blocks come in. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through that. Historically, the dynamic, and here's where we discuss kind of the, the flows here. You see this in, in Bitcoin charts. Um, here's just one example where you have these uh, two week periods uh, across time. And you can see clearly in these charts that the relationship between hash rate, block interval, and difficulty. And down below that chart is kind of a flow of how this happens. And again, the key thing here is that it's not just optimizing for that 10 minute block interval um, and miners being transaction processors to do so within that time frame. Miners are proxies 
for the market. Um, and so what you see here is that if there's increased market demand or price or expected to be increased market demand or price, um, that means miners are going to get more revenue as a result of the block rewards being more valuable that they receive. Same dynamic could happen if they get lower costs. Uh, for some reason, there's a new you know, rig or ASIC out or like energy prices go down or whatever. The point here is that whenever uh, miners are experiencing more profitable operations or expect to, um, they will then add more hash rate on the whole. Um, more miners will come into the network that have not been mining because of that profitability, increased profitability. profitability. Existing miners may deploy more infrastructure and rigs. And so when that happens, more hashes per second are occurring on the network, which results in faster block times. That indicates to the protocol that there's now higher hash rate on the network. And so as we just saw, the protocol says, I have to increase system difficulty. That makes it harder to mine a block, which, makes, which means it requires more hashes and compute to mine a block. That means it's less profitable for a miner to mine a block. As a result, hash rate will drop off the network and then block times will slow down towards their desired rates. And the same flow goes in reverse. Um, if, if hash rate goes off, difficulty drops. If hash rate goes up, difficulty is raised. And so that's kind of the, the dynamic here um, where miners are really, um, they're acting on their own behalf, but they're also acting in reaction as pass-throughs for market demand and for input costs that they face. And this is a, a key setup for what we'll be discussing. Um, the thing about Bitcoin in particular is on the supply side in terms of um, the actual Bitcoin that are being emitted as block rewards and its overall supply and that curve, it is not responsive. It is like the, what we just described is a highly responsive and adaptive system. Um, this is the opposite. This is like a totally predefined emissions curve um, that, you know, as, as we all know, like every four years, the block reward halves um, and it's set in stone. It's fixed. Um, as a result, in a normal market, uh, when prices go up or increased demand occurs, there's some ability for new supply to enter the market either net new supply or more sellers. Um, that does not happen here. The more sellers thing can happen, but there's no new issuance or different responsive issuance um, here. As a result, the market response is absorbed entirely into the difficulty adjustment and the price, which is good and bad. It's, uh, it's why Bitcoin is so volatile to the upside um, and, and maybe why it is not used as payment mechanism. Um, and maybe why it's, uh, it's, it's not taken seriously, but it is a feature um, that Bitcoin attracts attention and adoption as a result of its price. So net net, it's, a, it's obviously a smart design, but if you want to design a system that serves as a savings mechanism or a payments mechanism, you naturally cannot have a fixed supply curve. Um, any monetary policy um, of an economy needs to scale along with the growth of that economy and demand for that economy. Um, so you could though do the same thing on the supply side as you do for the difficulty adjustment. Um, just as you say, hey, uh, block times are faster, more hash rate has entered the network. As a result, that means more demand. We're gonna make it more difficult. You could do the same thing on supply and say, well, uh, more demand is coming. Uh, we're seeing that as a result, I can offer less, I can adjust my price, so to speak. I can offer less or more, more on the supply side. Um, and so this is something that I think sets up where Quai is going and how it's building what it is. And to put a finer point on this, um, this, is, uh, this is kind of where we'll leave it here. Um, we went through and discussed how Bitcoin and proof of work generally functions, what the mechanisms are, and the base level of it, func it, it functions to process and confirm transactions. Um, it, uh, it distributes new 
supply to the market via block rewards. Uh, and it also, most prominently, secures the system. Um, but there's a real, uh, a real awakening if you continue to dig deeper and understand essentially what these functions are. And I hinted at it across here. Um, just like Bitcoin and Quai, it, it, it is multifaceted. It is different things uh, for, for different purposes for different people. Um, and there's a, a kind of a, a ladder here of understanding the essential function and, and identity of what mining does. The base level one is mining is a transaction confirmation process. That's what it is. Um, yes, it's that, but that's like the bare minimum. Level two understands that mining is a security mechanism. It's not just a process, it's a mechanism design. And its function is security, its primary function. Bitcoin could not exist. In fact, the breakthrough was that uh, you could do this in a decentralized way, which means you needed to have a security mechanism uh, when you don't have a centralized party doing it. Um, and so what mining does is it adds work. Again, they're not solving anything. They're not adding any knowledge to the network um, or adding any expertise or anything. They are just sinking work with unforgeable cost into the network that makes it prohibitive to redo an attack. That's all they're doing. Um, not all they're doing, but that's what they're doing at that layer. Now that has some knock on effects about a price floor and a value for Bitcoin um, having un unforgeable cost and scarcity together um, adds value. But once you leave that level two, there's a couple levels above it where it gets really interesting and it's much less talked about, um, underappreciated and underexplored design space, but it's just the space that Kwai is taking advantage of. Um, basically, mine is a market coordination mechanism between the protocol and miners and end users, with miners acting both as principals, um, facing off against the, the protocol, but also as like proxy and agents for users um, to match demand with security. Um, how does Bitcoin know uh, how much security it needs to add and how much um, incentive it needs to provide for the network? It, it's just a protocol. And so that's why the difficulty adjustment in the mining mechanism is so ingenious is it is a market coordination effort um, between these parties to, uh, to be able to say, hey, you find these coins valuable, you need the network to be secured. I can secure the network, and as a result, I can um, earn revenue off of it. Um, that's a very hard thing to coordinate without a centralized party. And so the reframing of level three here is that the, what the difficulty adjustment actually is, is a, is a continuous auction market that's priced in hashes per coin um, or block reward. So what I mean by that is we already saw that uh, when blocks come in faster, that means that the hash rate has increased um, and the difficulty goes up. So what that means is more hashes will be required or expected on average in order to mine a block. What that means is that there's more hashes per block reward or per coin. Um, and that's vitally important because miners, um, their cost structure is about hashes, right? And so what this is, is truly a market and an auction for miners that's just not denominated in dollars. It's denominated in hash. Um, and so when difficulty goes up, the, the price in hashes per coin uh, that miners pay, so to speak, to earn rewards goes up, similarly on the way down. And so what this is, is ultimately a market priced in hashes in order for miners to provide security to the network at the benefit of those who use it and those who want to hold it. Um, and as there's more people who want to use and hold it, there's more demand which makes it more valuable, which makes block rewards more valuable, miners more profitable, and so on. And that is a very, very, very slick and elegant mechanism designed for a market. It does not go talked about, but this is ultimately, in my opinion, like the coolest thing about this mechanism. The last thing we're gonna discuss here is, is level four. And this is where 
choirs. Um, so it's not just um, this process, uh, a coordinating auction mechanism with price denominated in hashes. Um, it's a price discovery mechanism and an oracle system to bring real world information on chain about market demand and minor costs. So what I mean by that is, as I said before, the protocol doesn't know anything except for a few values are endogenous to the system. It does not even know how much hash rate is on the network. It knows how fast blocks are coming in. Um, and as a result, uses that as a proxy variable to estimate how much hash rate is on the network, which in turn is a proxy for market demand. As we saw earlier, hash rate will go up if there's uh, more market demand or expectation thereof. And so uh, that's, that's the most basic level of miners basically bringing real world information on chain. They're bringing real world information to the protocol um, about market demand for the coin. Um, and so now that variable exists in the system. Um, but there's, there's other things that, that, that they're bringing in too, and this is where Qua is, about their costs. Um, and so uh, miners, as we talked about, the, the two sides of it are, they will mine more when there's market demand, and as a result, uh, what they can sell coins for or the value of the block rewards they're earning increase. Um, or if their, their costs go down, um, uh, they become more efficient, um, they, they, uh, they do something or there's some macro level thing that brings electricity down or whatever. And the cost structure of miners um, is pretty interesting. Over the long term, um, especially as fixed and upfront costs get amortized, um, the by, like by far and away, the ongoing variable marginal cost input for miners is electricity. Um, again, people spend money on hardware, they spend money on hosting, all these things. A lot of it's fixed and upfront costs, and again, it gets amortized out. So over time, and on a variable marginal basis, it's primarily electricity inputs that drive minor decisions around whether or not to mine. They own the hardware, they have some facilities set up. Yeah, sure, there are costs for personnel and uh, internet and the actual infrastructure and, and buildings and whatnot. But um, again, on a long-term basis and certainly on a marginal basis, it's like 90, 95% energy. Um, and so if you view minor behavior in the system as bringing real world information on chain, one of the things they're bringing is, as we said, market demand. The other thing is their behavior is telling us things about their costs. And it's telling us, it's enabling us to have a baseline level um, for our coin issuance, especially when like Quai and unlike Bitcoin, on the supply side, you have a responsive curve um, so that block rewards can go up or down depending on how much hash rate there is and, and the difficulty level. When you pair those two things together and what Quai does and ultimately what she is, is it provides a mechanism to attempt to design supply of a crypto native non-intermediated non coin uh, to match minor production costs on an ongoing and variable basis which as we said is the two things that that influence that wholly are electricity and compute efficiency. Well, if you add in a discount or degradation for expected compute efficiency, like Chi does, all you're left with is energy. And so this is the mechanism by which Chi um, is able to get information from miners about their costs and as a result, the price of electricity, and it can then have a responsive supply to tie and connect its price to electricity. So in this way, Qi is an entirely new category creating crypto native cash that's naturally connected to the price of energy. It's a on-chain native, non-intermediated stablecoin alternative. It's a, it's a, a non-dollarized, stablecoin alternative 
Um, it is also an energy denominated asset that's particularly important for businesses like miners who have their input costs primarily affected by that asset, just like airlines um, hedge and buy oil because it's one of their biggest variable input costs. Um, many businesses like miners and others uh, are tied to electricity and would love to own that. And then the last thing is the increasingly digitally native network economies and compute markets that we're seeing today, if they had to pick what money a computer or machine would use, it would have two f features in my opinion. One, um, it needs to be uh, totally permissionless and sovereign um, because it cannot open a bank account as an autonomous agent or otherwise. Um, but two, and even outside of the autonomous angle, it should be denominated in energy. If you're a computer or run a compute business, um, you are in the field of handling the other side of that cost input equation for compute efficiency. What you cannot control is energy and electricity input costs. So it's very, very appealing um, for you to have your money denominated in the product, most productive asset and biggest input cost to your operations. Um, and that's true for AI businesses and autonomous agents themselves. And so this is what Kwai is doing with Qi um, and how it's achieving a, a version of on-chain monetary robust stability. Um, it's not a peg. It's not trying to maintain uh, a steady price of whatever it is, but it is generally connected to it and floats around it because it's able to have that floor and connect its supply issuance to minor production costs, which is huge. It would be the first of its kind um, native on-chain, non-intermediated stablecoin alternative and a form of energy-based money, which uh, is an idea that's been proposed in the past um, and in my opinion, is, uh, is a very, very compelling form of money um, for the 21st century compute-centric economy that we're going into. So we're gonna leave it here, but this is a foundation that I expect we'll have subsequent sessions on um, to go through mechanics of Qi specifically, um, but both, and which is what, what I really wanted to get to. But um, before we did that, I wanted to make sure we had a total foundation to work off of to understand not just the base level of how proof of work mining works, um, but these kind of new or underexplored concepts uh, and how Kwai is taking advantage of them. So that is it for my presentation today. Um, Max. This was great. I Are you willing to take a couple questions? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'll start with Kishore who asks, the production cost of electricity will continue to vary by country and by region based on local factors like local demand, the price of labor, natural resources, and even weather. Is this, do we call this a location-based arbitrage opportunity? So um, it's an interesting question. So yes, 100%, um, all those things are true. Um, what, Kwai is a global network, right? Um, and so when I speak about the price of electricity, you're right. It's a fairly segregated and regional, a very segregated and regional market. Um, and even, even like energy and electricity are different themselves. What I'm talking about is like a global, like periodic average over region and type of energy um, and time. So it's kind of like an average over all of those things. However, what I do believe is another interesting point here um, that, that ties into this is I, I listed off a bunch of different use cases and customer segments that are interested in this type of asset. Um, I think it's interesting that you can't really, I mean, there are very few energy derivatives. It's, it's all by and mar large a wholesale market. You have not had retail um, platforms and or access and or distribution for assets commodity assets like this, like energy and otherwise. Obviously there's structural reasons for that. There's market failure reasons around that with Enron and others. But I think it's a really, really interesting and attractive opportunity 
for people to be able to access these type of markets. And not just for speculation, but for actual stability, for non-dollarized offshore access to something stable and useful. Um, you know, a lot of people want dollars if they're offshore because they live in a hyperinflationary or unstable um, jurisdiction. But a lot of people don't care about dollars. They just want something stable or actually would prefer to not have dollars, but like there's nothing else available. And so I think that's interesting here. The other thing is over time, and if, if this comes to fruition, energy is fun, foundationally more stable than, I mean, there's no such thing as dollar stability. It's a tautology. Everything is priced in dollars. Like you can't, can't, can't be stable to itself. Um, energy is like a foundational, foundational part at the bottom of the pillar of or pyramid of the global economy. Um, and so if you could tap into that access and have uh, that level of stability, that also is naturally connected to purchasing price power because um, energy is a massive, massive input cost at the very bottom of the supply chain, um, such that if, if energy gets a lot cheaper, you say, well, oh man, I'm gonna like lose my purchasing price power. But it also means that all the goods that it flows up to are gonna get cheaper. And so unlike the dollar, which is not connected to the actual economic and value supply chain, energy is at the root of it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that was a great answer. Another question I see here is, do you think that crypto natives slash crypto culture will become more like TradFi while TradFi institutions reinforce their operations in the space? Asking this question, considering your background in TradFi. Um, yes to everything. Um, so I think like they'll they'll be segments as a market matures like crypto. Um, it used to be that crypto was just one thing. It's crypto, but as it grows up and matures, just like every other industry or business um, line, there become sub segments um, within it. Um, and, and you're already seeing that now there's already like different cultures and different, um, levels of traditional versus like cutting edge versus whatever else you're already starting to see that, um, in crypto, the trajectory that I normally see is like something like crypto or tech and the internet. And you saw it, it starts out, it's, it's one thing. It's definitely on the edge and revolutionary and, you know, non mainstream, non legacy. Then it starts to grow up. And as I said, you kind of have these sub segments that go their different ways. Someone has a strategy to, to become more mainstream. Someone has a strategy to keep pushing. Some people are in the middle. And then like when it matures and matures, like it becomes that like hardened, ossified, like serious thing by and large. But I think even that trajectory is changing now. You're starting to see kind of a reworking of, um, of what, of like how people are supposed to, every, everything is up for grabs in this 21st century, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and I actually think that if anything, financial services may become more like crypto, then crypto become more like financial services. Sounds like a fun world, one I would love to live in. You do. Let's see, last question I'll ask uh, is, what is your vision for Quai Network? And curious, what what is your role at the company currently entail? Yeah, so um, I joined uh, Quai. Um, obviously, I've been in the space for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, when I saw Bitcoin, uh, you know, I was at a company where the predecessor company to DCG was called Second Market. We created markets um, for emerging assets and underserved and illiquid marketplaces. So, you know, we were we were trading bankruptcy claims before anyone had done that. We created the first, you know, pre-IPO um, stock. Nowadays, like everybody before a tech company goes private, they're brokers that allow you to sell your stock. We were the first to do that. And ultimately that business got bought by NASDAQ. We were trading um, intellectual property rights. We were trading uh, hedge fund interest. We were trading auction rate securities. We were always on the lookout for like the next asset class and markets that we could make. I've always been extremely fascinated by markets. Um, and so when we saw Bitcoin, I like absolutely fell down the rabbit hole because it's not just a new asset or asset class um, that's tradable and interesting. It's not just a new form of 
money um, or you know a new type of asset or like gold, it is actually fundamentally changing the nature of how markets work um, and where they're integrated within a system. Uh, we just discussed how Bitcoin integrates market mechan- mechanisms in its in its design natively, and that's just not how other things work. So I'm incredibly interested in that. Um, I'm also a firm believer of kind of like our, our trajectory towards a more network economy. And I would say I'm like in the camp of it being a barbell society going forward where hyper-connected, hyper-local, hyper-global, hyper-local, hyper-digital, hyper-physical, so on and so forth. And so what attracted me to Kwai is it's kind of a bridge between those worlds. You know, if you have a thesis as I do, that the world has become hyper-local, hyper-global, um, and hyper-digital, hyper-physical, the idea that like you could create a cryptocurrency that's connected to re- reliable real-world value that is also utilizing a compute network in the form of mining and otherwise to, to do so in that hyper, hyper digital and compute centric world, world um, it is helping shape the market economy for like the 21st century um, for an entirely new form of, um, of economies and, and new forms of commodities and assets where bandwidth and compute and so on and so forth are going to become assets. I know people are always saying, no, data is the new oil or whatever else, but you're ultimately going to see, um, and we're already there. I mean, we already have a compute centric world that we're just connected by smartphones and elsewhere. So Kwai is at a, at a place where it can create the type of money and the type of assets that are relevant to the existing world and physical world, and particularly relevant to the future and digital world, and particularly a compute centric economy for um, AI, LLMs, and otherwise. Excuse me. I think this was a, a great presentation, and we really appreciate your time. I know normally these are Dr. K, but it's fun to switch them up every once in a while and get kind of that, uh, maybe not less technical, but uh, maybe like higher level is the word I'll use, uh, view of some of these things. But I'll be yeah, back. I hope that, yeah, I hope that we can have you back at some point soon for maybe to go deeper on the Kwai Chi stuff. Um, but yeah, I think. Hopefully everyone in the audience had a chance to learn something. Hope that y'all enjoyed having David as a, as a presenter. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see everyone next time. Thanks for your time, David. And I hope we get to bring you back soon. Yep. Later, Gator.